B-Sides DC 2016 videos are brought to you by ClearedJobs.net and CybersecJobs.com, tools for your next career move, and Antietam Technologies, focusing on advanced cyber detection, analysis, and mitigation. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Appreciate it. The next hour of your life is going to be so entertaining and so fun, you are not going to believe you're in D.C. We are going to talk about how to join the information security com community. And for those of you that didn't know it, it's 2016. It is. We have amazing things in 2016. We've got hoverboards. Well, yeah, they catch fire and they have wheels, but they are hoverboards, right? Right? We have self-driving cars, which is pretty cool. We even have, let's say that you're making dinner, okay? And, and you have a grape that falls on the floor and it breaks open. We have robots that can stitch grapes together because somewhere in the world, that's a need. Well, I mean, these things are out there. And it's an amazing, amazing world we live in. And it's kind of cool because um, at, at work, I'm, I'm kind of a uh, senior person. Okay? I've grown up through all of the old things that have happened, and, and now there's all these new things in this world. And constantly, people come to me and they say, hey, you know what? You're a senior person. Would you be my mentor? Would you teach me how to get into the information security community? Would you teach me how to be where you are on that side of the desk? And ultimately, the conversation moves into, how do I infosec? What do I do to do information security things? Not just at work, but in other places. And so I have to introduce to my mentees the concept of information security industry versus information security community. There is a difference. And for those of you that have been in the industry for a while, you'll recognize it. This is the professional, you know, you're going to work, you're talking with customers, you're talking with clients, you're solving solutions, versus the community which, well, is you. People that go to conferences, sit down and pick locks, do other things. They're distinct, but there's a lot of overlap. And I wish I had made a Venn diagram that shows the overlap. Some people, like I used to do, stay in the information security, and like I used to do, um, stay in the information security industry and don't dip their toe into the community. They don't come over here and see all the cool things that we're doing. Now, that's an absolutely fine thing to do because some people need that. They feel secure just being in the community, being in the industry. Or likewise, some people love being in the community without necessarily getting into the industry section. But nowadays we have an issue. We have, at least in the DC area here, we've got more jobs in InfoSec than we have people to fill them. So we have this huge demand for people to come and do the work for either our customers or for our companies. And that's a great position to be in as a in person already in InfoSec. I, I love having that all these companies want me to come work for them. That's really cool. If you're somebody that actually is looking to get into InfoSec, then this talk is for you. This is a, a talk to help you join your InfoSec industry life and your InfoSec community life, or if this community life isn't necessarily that strong for you right now, I'll give you some, some tips, some points. But if you are one of the people that's trying to hire one of these people, trying to get them to come to your company, I would almost guess that you've tried all the traditional ways of, hey, we'll post something on our website and we'll just wait for resumes to come in. And I'm kind of guessing that that's not working as well in this market as it might have been 5, 10, 15 years ago. And that's because it's a buyer's market as far as jobs. We, the people with the skills, can shop around, get new jobs in a day, in a week. It's really easy. So one of the things that I find is that if we have people that want smart InfoSec community people, and we have people that want to join the InfoSec community, then this is the prime place for each of those different groups to meet. And you have vendors out here, people that are looking to hire people just like you and me. And it's a great place. It's a great feeling to be in. What I find is that if you marry the industry with the community, it's like taking chocolate and peanut butter 
and putting them together to, I'm just hy hypothesizing, I'm thinking this might work. Putting chocolate and peanut butter together m might be a good thing. And that's what we're doing here. Because the community augments the industry. And the industry augments the community. We'll see how that works. But right now, I want to show you my 14 tips to enhance your community life or if you're looking to hire people in the community to get into their lifestyle, meet them where they are so that you can hire them and ultimately retain them. The first thing is really that double-edged sword, that catch-22. It's like, I'm going to tell you to get experience. Well, that's great, Micah. The reason why I'm here is that I don't have experience and I want to break in the industry. Cool, I get it. Information security is a really, really wide, wide field. And it can get quite deep as well. What do you do? What do you start? How do you start? The way that I like to tell people to start is you start with general experiences. Right? Uh, let's say that you're a person that's, uh, that's an audiophile. You really like, like sound systems and, and your home entertainment system is really like smoking at home. Cool. You have some skills there. Your, your home system might have Wi-Fi on it. It might do some things um, interesting with sound. You can parlay that. You can mix that up with some computer things, whether you're using a Raspberry Pi to, to power that or something else. Or what if you are playing with Raspberry Pis, or you heard of one and you, you want to play around with it? In information security, what we do is we take those basic skills. I'm guessing that some of you might have parents or relatives that you are the primary help desk person, right? When they click an email that they shouldn't have? Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know why my screen has this face on it, but it says I need to pay some bitcoins to get back in. Yeah, you are the primary people. And that help desk work, that regular system administrator work, that's your foundation. What I think is that people that have that foundation of normal, everyday InfoSec skills can pile on the infosec to the top of it, can, can learn the information security stuff that leverages those foundational skills. So when, when people says go out and learn things, go out and do things, yeah, you can get a certification, but play with your computers. Try out other types of architectures or, or devices, mobile things, because that foundation is going to help you be more effective when you get into other types of the infosec industry. And for those of you in the infosec already, you understand that there's actually, once you get into InfoSec, because that's a lot of people's job. They want, I want to get into InfoSec. And you get in there, and then people start talking about reverse engineering and IDSs and policy. And, and, and you realize that there's this other inverted pyramid on top. And InfoSec is really quite broad. And that's okay. Because there's time for you to become a specialist. There's time for you to take and keep building upon your information security knowledge to uh, grow and, and ultimately give back. Now, when I started in this industry, I started back with ye olde timey stuff. Yeah, Pong, Tari. Yeah, those were my basic skills. I started playing on Apple IIe and, and writing some interesting programs for it. And then I graduated up to NT40. Any NT40 MCSEs out there? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, that's what I started doing, playing with Windows systems. And, and I got a job doing system administrator work. And it was cool. I was learning how these systems worked properly. Once I did that sufficient, I actually started playing with Solaris as well. My boss said, hey, Micah, you understand this Windows system administration stuff. Cool. How about you come and do this Unix stuff? Because it's very, very similar. It's just totally different. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I guess I can. And you don't, so what do you do when you don't know what to do? You Google it. Or back then, you AOL it. Yeah. So, so I asked Jeeves, thank you, sir. Yes, from the past. So, so, you know, you go on there and, you, and there's lots of people that can help you out. I found a nice person that had posted, you know, if you're a new person that, that needs help uh, testing your, your Unix system, as the root user, type in rm minus rf slash. <laughs> it was the best way that I learned how to rebuild that server after it started removing all of the files on it. Um, but yeah. So there's things out there. This is my experience. This is my foundation. And I'll bet each and every one of you has some of that stuff. And you know what? If there's things that you don't know, 
You go out and learn. And that's my tip number two. Learn things. Take control over your self-learning. And I say self-learning. Some of us, we learn better by, by standing in it and by, by being in a room where an instructor is leading us. Absolutely cool. Some of you have the self-discipline to do a, an on-demand type of a course or watch a YouTube video and learn stuff from it. Cool. Wherever you're at, there are resources out there that can help you. Whether it's, you guys have heard of YouTube? Yeah, it's, it's a new site. Um, yeah, YouTube. You go on there and you type, how do I? You get a lot of interesting uh, responses back there. Some of that is InfoSec stuff. And you can do anything from how do I attack this system or leverage PowerShell in this or some of uh, the primal sex stuff. Do you guys have videos out there? On, yeah, on YouTube. Right, Python learning and, and other things. It's a valuable resource if you're the type of person that can learn stuff from videos. I'm a type of person where I need it spelled out for me too. So wikis and blogs, there are people that will find, anybody see the, the Fruity Armor APT attack or the Dyn uh, DNS attack just this past week? There are already blog posts out there, detailed blog posts by Krebs and other people that have outlined exactly how this thing goes, how these things went on. And it breaks it down for us. So learn. Capture the flags are a wonderful time to learn too because there you're doing hands-on stuff, not just reading about something, not just getting a video about something, but actually doing hands-on. This morning I did some of the, the crypt, I mean, I watched as my kids did some of the Crypt Kids uh, CTF and it was really cool just to get back into like ciphers and all, just to do something and have a goal to achieve. I mentioned that the, one of the ways that I like to learn was doing instructor-led training. And so in, back in the early 2000s, I took a class from the Sands Institute, and it was so empowering. I went there, I learned, I took that stuff back to my work, and I said, hey, let me show you how our systems are insecure. And I did it. My boss's eyes got open, and, and he said, this is, this is great. We need you to, to be an InfoSec person all the time. I was like, cool. So I kind of parlayed it into an InfoSec career. I'm like, yeah. I'm an information security professional now. This is awesome. I got cards with that on there. I felt really good. And you know, the best part about information security professionals is this. Well, if you Google it and you go to Google Images, you get this guy. Now, any of you InfoSec professionals out there actually do this on a daily basis? It probably deals with cybers or something or, I don't know, holograms. Maybe we just haven't gotten there yet. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, and you know, being in the industry, because I was doing this all, all for work, and, and you know, I went to Sands through work, and I did all these other things through work, I got my CISSP, because you know, that taught me more about the industry. I was a really happy camper, I was feeling good about myself, I, I was learning things. And so my boss came up to me and said, hey, you know what, you're getting pretty good at this, how about if you go out to Black Hat? You know that, this big like, InfoSec community, uh, InfoSec uh, training out in Las Vegas. It's like, you're going to send me to Vegas for a week for free? Really? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Oh, and I have to go to talks? Cool. So I went there, and uh, that's me at Caesar's Palace, yeah. Um, so I went there, and, and I learned, and these talks were wonderful. I actually found out in the talks, uh, this was my first information security conference, and um, I'd never been to one before, and I found out I had some skills. I really did, and it made me feel good, because I found out that there were vendors out there that will give you stuff. All you have to do is scan your badge. They will give you free stuff. I got so much stuff, I had to buy another suitcase to get it all home. Well worth it, though, well worth it. I still get emails from that. But um, <laughs> when I was in, in 2006, I was out there, and my, my boss said, you know what, Micah, since you're already out there, we heard about this other conference. It, it's kind of exactly like Black Hat. It's DEF CON. It's just exactly, exactly the same, but totally different. So, do you want to go? It's like, yeah, it's only 100 bucks. I'll go. And so I went there, and I met hackers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hackers were scary people at that time. These were people with, with, with ski masks on, typing with gloves. That is Uber. Have you ever tried to type with gloves on? This guy's got some skills, right? Yeah, but the, this was like mixing information security professional with this, this weird class of people that I never, ever met of. I just, I never met, but I'd always heard about them. 
And so what I did was I went to DEF CON and I stayed as far back from all of the things. They had this cool cooler contest where to see how fast you could cool down beverages. Like, that's really cool. I'm not doing anything with it. I'm just staying back. They had this wall where they had intercepted all of people's uh, clear text communications, all the Wi-Fi, and they'd taken out usernames and passwords, and they put this on the wall of sheep. I was like, wow, that's me. Oh, my God, is my Wi-Fi on? So I observed from a distance because I was not yet ready to engage with the community, with those people. And that's cool. That's where I was at at that time. And I stayed in that place for many, many years. Until one day, a good buddy of mine, actually P.W. Crack, Bob Weiss here, who runs Besides DC, uh, he kept hammering on me. He's like, hey, you know what? You got to come to Virginia. I live in Maryland. He's like, you got to come to Virginia with me. There's a bunch of people, Nova hackers. I'm like, oh, hackers. I can't do that. He said, no, come. They're normal people. They just like information security. It's like, all right. So I went. And that's my tip number three. Join a group. Like I said, I joined Nova Hackers, but since then, I found there's unallocated space up in Baltimore. There's other groups out there. Go to these groups. It says hackers in it, or unallocated. I have no idea what that means. It's like a memory corruption thing. But these are places with people just like you and me. In fact, a lot of the volunteers and a lot of people in the audience probably have been to one of these groups at one point in their lives. Or maybe they're regular members, or maybe they run them. These groups are great because they meet on a regular basis in communities like yours and mine. And they talk about information security. They talk about the things that we're interested in. And they help raise your awareness. You can talk to the people that just gave a talk. In fact, these are groups that are uh, self-run. So participation is a must. Each person in the organization stands up and gives a 15-minute talk about something. If you don't want to join these groups, that's cool. There's ISSA chapters out there. There's even OWASP chapters, the Open Web Application Security Project, all around the world. Don't like that? There's meetups. Do information dash security if you go to meetups and you want to look for a group. Um, InfoSec had very few uh, hits on it. But there are these groups that are out there all over the world that have opportunities for you to connect with other people just like you. And you know what it does? When you're going to look for that next job or when you need help with that Python script or when you want to get into ham radio but you have no idea what you're doing, these are the people that are going to help you. These are the people that are going to connect you with the resources or just teach you. Now, I mentioned that these groups are groups where the members many times will present to, to the other members. And what I, that, that creates a big barrier for people. In fact, if you go to the novahackers.com website, you'll see that you know, there's a fight night type of mentality where your first time there, you have to present. It's not that way, actually. And what people generally tell me is that, you know, hey, I go to these things, but you know what? Everybody knows exactly what I know. Everybody knows the things that, that I would present on, so I really don't have anything I can present on. That's not the case. Within the industry, there's something called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is where you feel inadequate about your skills and abilities because everybody else is doing things that you, aren't, that you are not doing, and, and they're doing uber-elite things that you're not. And so you feel like your skills, your connections, what you're doing, it can't compete with that. I had a very bad case of imposter syndrome when I came back from DerbyCon one year, about four years ago. I came back, I saw people doing O-Days and, and PowerShell stuff and, and really cool things. And I got back and I was like, you know what? I'm not doing any of that stuff. What the heck, what good am I doing in, in, in the industry? And I actually started looking for jobs outside of InfoSec. I didn't find any that paid that well or, or anything, so I stayed in the industry. But this is something that, that's very pervasive, especially for people just looking to break in. But here's the thing. Bill Nye puts it, puts it very succinctly, that everyone you, ha you meet knows something that you don't. It's just a matter of whether that can come out. You might meet somebody that's really good at like kernel rootkit development or just understanding kernel stuff. You might meet people that understand how to program or how to program in languages that have not even been invented yet. 
Or you might meet people that do what this guy's doing because I don't even know what part of InfraSec that's in. But it looks awesome. It deals with miniaturization, uh, the, the keys. It should just say password. It should just say password. I, I think that's under the keyboard. Yeah, it says password. But yeah, so you know something that somebody else doesn't know. You just have to figure out what it is. Um, I talked, uh, I did a similar talk to this at uh, B-Sides Charm earlier this year. And I brought up that one of our members uh, in Nova Hackers one day gave a talk about how to brew the best cup of coffee. It's like, well, that's not related to InfoSec, but if you think about it, what do we run on? Caffeine, right? So this was very, very well, well uh, written, well, well uh, received talk. So, you know stuff. How do you know when you're going to get where you're going? You got to set goals. Because as Yogi Berra says, if you don't set goals and you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you're going to get there? This is an important piece of our, of our lives. You might not be a person that sets a, a year, five-year, ten-year plan. That's cool. I'm not either. But I can tell you this. You can set short-term goals. I'm going to achieve this certification by this date. I'm going to learn Python and create my first script on that date. And hold yourself accountable to those dates. Put them in your, your uh, whatever you use to, to keep track of dates and times. Make it a firm appointment with yourself to to go ahead and, and achieve that goal. And then when you achieve it, set another goal or set more goals. Because you know what, when you do this, you'll be able to track your progress. You'll be able to see that you have learned new things. You have developed over time, which is a lot of things that we don't look for. When we are trying to get through um, the information security industry, we're always looking ahead. We're looking at that new skill we want to learn. We're looking at that new technique, that new opportunity. You don't see the stuff that you've already tackled. You don't see the stuff that you already know. That junior people are looking up and going, holy cow, I have to learn what TCP IP means? I can barely spell it. IPv6? Forget about it. But you know it. It's core to you, and you've already moved on. So um, make sure that you make, make time for yourself to achieve your goals. Next thing is open source projects. Open source projects are really important, I feel, because it's your chance to give back to the community. It's also another place to engage with community. These are projects that people are making and publishing the code online. There's lots of opportunities. When I was a Unix system administrator, I could write bash scripts really well. But I found as I got older that bash wasn't a great programming language, and there were these other things like Python and Ruby and Perl. Okay, maybe not Perl, but there's Python and Ruby. And, sorry, if you like Perl, uh, well, never mind. Um, so I decided to learn Python. And, and I participated with a, a project called Recon NG. It was really good because what I found is that I could do all of the tutorials online. I could listen to all of the Primal Sec podcasts and do all of their trainings and stuff like that. And that was great. But if I actually sat down at a keyboard and tried to type out some Python, tried to make a script, I was ineffective. I could not do it. I needed a goal. And so Recon NG allowed me to mix web application stuff, which I under, already knew, along with Python. And marrying that chocolate and peanut butter together allowed me to have a reason to Python. Now, one of the things I hear is that from people is, well, I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to code things, so I can't participate in the open source community. And I say that's wrong, because there are projects out there that if you know how to use Notepad or TextPad or Sublime or whatever it is, gedit, you can participate. Here's just three of them that came up off the top of my head. I have a project on my, on my GitHub where I have published just essentially a text document. And that text document is uh, interview questions if you're looking to interview text, um, uh, technical people. So there's just questions. There's no programming, it's just documents. Um, the FuzzDB, the Fuzz database, all that is is lists of words, special words, organized. Maybe there's a list of usernames, a list of passwords, a list of files on a certain server. If you can type in file names or usernames, you can contribute. And then there's uh, Justin Nordine's OSINT framework. This is just uh, essentially like bookmarks. They're URLs that you copy, you paste in there, and you're done. It's pretty easy. And anybody can do it if they want to. 
Micah's step number six is attend and participate. That's the important part at conferences. You've already satisfied probably both of these here, this, here today, maybe yesterday, right? How many of you uh, did another activity aside from just uh, attending the, the talks? How many of you picked locks? Or how many of you did a wireless CTF or the Crypt Kids thing? Or, or yeah, you're already doing this stuff. And there are lots of opportunities for you within this DC, Maryland, Virginia area to attend conferences. These, these conferences like this, the B-sides, they're great for meeting people in your community, for talking with people, for making those connections, and for learning your new skills. Besides DC this weekend, besides NOVA is the first ever Northern Virginia Conference. Um, the call for papers is out there, and uh, they're going to be doing some amazing things in Reston, Virginia, Herndon, Virginia, uh, coming up in February, and besides Charm in April. All of them, great conferences for connecting with people. And I already mentioned that at these conferences, they'll have the open organization of lock pickers, Tool, or some other people there doing a lock pick village. If you've never picked the lock, as some of you probably haven't ever done, go in that room over there, sit down at a table, pick up a turning tool and a pick, and start out with the basic one lock. It's amazing, that feeling. I saw some people today, they were like, oh, I just picked the lock. I'm like, yeah. Didn't get arrested either. It's awesome, right? Yeah. But try things. Participate. Uh, when I was over there, I was sitting at the table, and the people around there were like, hey, this is just like, you know, we all have our turning tools and our lockpicks. They're like, this is just like a clam bake, you know, where you're just sitting around socializing, and every now and then somebody's like, hey, look. And, oh, look, don't eat the locks. No. But, but yeah, I mean, it's a social time to be together with other people and learn from other people, teach other people. If you're a lock picker, sit down and show somebody that doesn't have the skills or doesn't have them yet. There's also the CTF over there that's going on. Um, my first CTF was at DerbyCon several years ago, and several of the guys that I did it with are here in the audience. I had gone to DerbyCon, you know, with that, that telescope going, hey, that's kind of neat. They're doing, like, wireless hacking in that room. That's neat. I could probably do that. Yeah, but I'm not going to put my network, my computer on that network. It's probably a hostile network, you know, hackers. Um, but then the next year, I was like, you know, if I format the hard drive, put in, you know, some some simple system in there, if it gets compromised, I can just throw away the hard drive or reformat it, whatever. I could participate in this, and so I did that, and we got a team together, and we did the we did the CTF, and I said, I'm just going to sit down. It's 12 o'clock on Friday. I'm just going to go until I'm bored. That's all. We didn't stop until 12 o'clock on Sunday. We hacked the whole time. And each day was neat because I would call out something like, hey, I got this. I have no idea what it's like. And Luke or Andrew would be like, oh, I know how to do that. Can you help me with this? And we would share information. And we would learn from each other. It was a great experience. We took third place that year. One of the other things that you can do is talk to the speakers like myself, like Andrew, like other people that are talking. We're here to help you learn and understand things. And if you want to connect with us, we're, yeah, don't talk right now to me, but talk later on to me. But, but talk to us. Come up and talk to us. Share your experiences. Help us make our talks better. Or tell us how we connected with you. Because this is an important part of the dialogue of the information security community. Again, talking to people and making connections. Next thing you can do is make a blog. Now, many people tell me, oh, I got nothing to post. I, I don't know what I write about. Uh, Carnal Onage, uh, Chris Gates, he's the, one of the founders of Nova Hackers, great guy. Um, he said, you know what? I don't blog for other people. I blog because it's kind of a public way of me keeping notes. Because you're touching a lot of different systems or you're doing a lot of different stuff, and invariably in eight months or 12 months or two years later, you're like, damn, didn't I already do this once? You can just go back to your blog and pick it up. And your blog can help other people as well. So what I did when I came back from that CTF that I did at DerbyCon, I made a blog post. And I heard um, one, a person uh, commented on that and said, hey, listen, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a, a CTF as well. I thought, that's great. You know, it helps one other person. And it helps me too keep track of my, my adventures. There's other blogs that are out there that can be helpful. If you want to create your own blog, do it. Or your own podcast, do it. 
But there's some that are, out, that are out there that are really, really good. For instance, Leslie Carhart, Hacks for Pancakes is her Twitter handle. She has an awesome blog. And you know what? Her blog, she has seven chapters of how to break into inf information security. What I'm talking about today, lots of people are talking about it. She has an amazing, well-organized and well-written blog that you can use. I put a little short URL at the bottom. It's not going to rickroll you or download malware. Um, or will it? <laughs> Next thing I want you to do is go and volunteer. Give of your time. Why? You meet people. How many of you have volunteered at a conference before? Nice. Thank you all. I appreciate your service. There's the opportunities to do it besides DC. They were still looking for people up until you know a couple days ago. You want to volunteer at besides Nova coming up in in February? There's opportunities available. You can just go in and, and check in people. You can help speakers. You can run uh, some some type of uh, 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 some of the the events that are going on there. There's lots of opportunities to pitch in. Go ahead and do it. Next thing, ask for and take feedback. Anybody heard of this? That most people listen with the intent. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand, but the intent to reply. How many times have you been sitting there and maybe you're talking to your spouse or your kid and they're like, blah, 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 and you're thinking in your head, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share this life lesson with my child or, or my wife, I'm going to tell her this. And you're not hearing the other stuff that she's saying or he's saying. You're hearing what you want to trigger your response without taking in the entire conversation. If we open ourselves up to actually hear what other people are saying, it can be very powerful. I'll give you an uncomfortable situation when this happened. I was presenting a talk at B-Sides Boston. Um, great conference, had a great time up there, and my talk was called Running Away from Security. The talk was essentially about finding people online and tracing them back to their homes or their, uh, virtually tracing, not actually appearing at somebody's house, and that would be awkward. Hello, I'm Micah, I found you online. <laughs> so, but tracing them back. And I had three examples that I used in that talk. Guess what? They were all women. They just work. I mean, they, that's okay. I mean, as far as I'm concerned. But a lady raised her hand at the end of my talk. She said, um, Mr. Hoffman, what do you have against women? I don't have anything against women. I love women. My wife's a woman. I, I like it. So she said, all three of your examples were about women. Why didn't you use one about men? I'm like, well, I, I just didn't. But I thought about it, I was like, well, why couldn't I? So I took her feedback, which was not necessarily used in the best manner. I found out later she had a feminist blog and she was just using, she was doing this to everybody at the conference, but that's okay. Her point was that my examples were biased. So I went home and my daughter and I sat down and we figured out a way to take the three examples and find a one with a man in it. And you know what? My talk got better because that man that we used for an example was actually a better example than the woman that I was using. So I listened to what she was saying and uh, I actually learned a lot and, and my talk got better. Next thing, as you start to learn stuff, share it. Even if you don't think that you know a lot, you may surprise yourself. And here's the thing, you could take the things that you learned here at this conference, whether it was Andrew's talk or somebody else's talk or my talk, back to your organization, whatever it is, back to your college, back to your high school, and say, I learned how hospitals are vulnerable to things, or I learned this really cool thing about Python or PowerShell or whatever. Talk to them, uh, do it over lunch. Have a, if you live in a state where you can have lock picks, Break out your lock pit set and show them how to break locks. It's cool. I went to Home Depot one day and bought $100 worth of locks, just grabbing deadbolts off of the shelves and, and padlocks and I had my arms full of stuff. And a Home Depot employee came over and he's like, can I help you, sir? I'm like, no, I got a lock picking thing tonight. I'm fine. And he's like, oh, what? <laughs> so, but yeah, we just took them home. We took them back to the office. We broke them up and we just started picking them. And it's amazing. If you're new to lock picking, it's really easy to pick some of the lower quality locks out there. And people were, were, were enjoying it.
So share your information. Go to the career day at your children's schools. Don't, don't just show up at the school and like, hey, I want, I want to talk to you about information security. Schools frown upon adult males like just arriving there at the doors unannounced. Um, but mentor kids. Mentor other people, junior people that may not know as much as you. There's a person in my organization, really smart guy, really smart. And, and he's in one area of information security that I know very little about. And one day he came to me, he's like, hey, I'd like to mentor with you. I'm like, cool, all right. He's like, I know nothing about networking. I'm like, what do you mean you know nothing about networking? He's like, I don't know what TCP IP means. I don't know what a port is or a protocol. It's like, you're like an expert over here in this. How do you not know about that? But he didn't because he specialized he didn't get that foundation of knowledge. He specialized, and that's absolutely cool. He's an awesome rock star. And I helped him learn some things that I thought were basic and that he already knew. But we shared knowledge. We shared information. Now, if you so choose, you can go the professional route and start sharing. I decided to become a SANS instructor and teach people how to web hack um, and share my knowledge that way. And it was great. I love meeting students. I love talking with them and sharing knowledge. And you could do classes as well. Liam Randall over here, he does his bro classes that are just amazing. And other people as well. You could teach at B-Sides conferences. It's pretty cool stuff. One of the things I already alluded to was track your progress. Now tracking your progress could be just putting a star on a calendar. It could be marking off that you achieve certain goals. It could be any one of a number of things. Let me make it simple for you though. I have one of these things hanging on the wall in my office. And you might not be able to see it. Um, this is a runner uh, plaque, essentially. You, you buy this thing uh, from like running on the wall or some other site is on Amazon. And there's just little hooks coming out on it. And it says at the top, success isn't how far you got, but the distance you traveled from where you started. When people come into my office, junior people, they're like, how do I, how do I get into InfoSec? How do I do what you're doing? I can point to this. Because this has every badge, and when I go back to my office, this badge will go on there too. Every badge for every conference I've ever been to is on that wall. Every training I've been to is on that wall. And I can say, I've put in my time, I've put in effort, I've participated. That's how you start. And you know what? You could buy one of these and you put today's badge, the one that you're wearing right now, put it right on there. And then next year and the year after, and soon you'll be able to see, damn. I've been to a lot of conferences. And maybe your badges start changing colors because you start becoming speakers or you start being volunteers. That tracks your progress too. Next, we're going to talk about joining Twitter. Now, this is pretty sensitive to people that, some of the people in the audience that may work in a, a sensitive area in D.C. or Maryland or Virginia where you're not necessarily allowed to have social media accounts. Cool, I get it. But I'll tell you this, Twitter is a wonderful place for you to connect with people. It's bi-directional. I don't know if some of you look old enough that you might remember BBSs. Remember, you used to dial up? Yeah. You, there were people that, so let me take off, let me put on my old guy hat. Back when I was a kid, we, we had modems and we liked it. No, we used to dial into systems. I'm sorry, that was slightly Bernie Sanders too. Sorry. Um, but we dial into these places and, and, and we would connect with other people. But there were some people that wouldn't upload files. They were, they were just lurkers. They would just sit there and watch or maybe they would download files without participating. On Twitter, that's absolutely cool. You create a Twitter account, you make it so nobody can follow you, but you follow other people and you get to learn about stuff. If you don't know who to follow, here are three quick things that you can do. Follow hashtag InfoSec, follow Besides DC and follow me. And you find through what I retweet or what I tweet, other people that have similar ideas to what you want, other things that you want to get into. The other neat thing is if you wanted to contact me right now, you probably don't have my email address. Many of you do, but you might not have my email address. But you can on Twitter, you can send me a direct message. It's like having my home phone number. And you can do that for anybody that has a Twitter account that allows that type of access. You want to talk to Adam Savage, the Mythbuster? Bam, you can DM him. Brian Krebs, bam, you can, you can send him a, a tweet and put his name in there or, or whatever. 
but you can communicate with people. You're having a problem running a Recon NG. You send something to Landmaster 53. Tim Tums will pick that up and go, let me see if I can help you. Or Rafi over here, if you've been over here to the Cobalt Strike booth. Really responsive people. Twitter is the way to do it. The fruity armor APT attack, the, the uh, dirty cow stuff that's coming out, the dime DNS stuff, all that stuff was on Twitter way before it hit mainstream media. So you get things faster this way too. My next hint, my next tip, is to surround yourself with people smarter than you. Many of you are in organizations where you are the only InfoSec person, so you can't do this, right? But maybe you've joined Nova Hackers. Maybe you've done some of these online classes. Maybe you're on Twitter and you start surrounding yourself with the Twitter universe, with the, the other tweeps, Twitter peeps, um, and you start using those people as your organization. Because you know what? If you're a big fish in a small pond, you probably feel pretty good about yourself. That's great. Yeah, you guys know about this, this nine-year-old rugby player in Australia? Dude is crushing it. He's huge and very strong. And he's just like flinging kids. It's like what the Hulk did in the Marvel comics. You know, in all those movies, like, and just kids are flying. In this, you'll notice that every other kid on the opposing team has a helmet on, but he does not. He's just like throwing kids left and right. But I'll tell you this, once he, those kids get bigger or he gets promoted to the next league where he's maybe as strong as other people, he might not have taken the time to learn the techniques that he needs in order to move on to the next level or the, in order to continue to succeed. You, can, you look at him as opposed to Rudy, Daniel Ru Rudinger. Um, this is the guy who the movie Rudy was about, Notre Dame player, uh, football player. He, only made th he was only playing at Notre Dame for three plays in his entire life. But... He set a goal way on, early on in his high school life. And, and he said, I want to play for Notre Dame. And he tried to get into Notre Dame, and he didn't, his grades weren't good enough. So he joined the Navy. And then after he got out of the Navy, he went to a two-year college, and he learned there. Then he got into to Notre Dame. But he didn't get on the football team because he was too small. He was only 5'6 and 160 pounds. But he kept trying, and he kept doing things and participating. And the final game of it, the final, um, pl the final play of, plays of the final game of his college career, coach put him in. And the dude got the final tackle that ended the game. It was a sack on the quarterback. And he is only one of two people that ever got carried off the, the field on people's shoulders, not like on a stretcher. He was the only, it's like, no, I've watched the game before. We've seen a lot of people carried up. No, he's only one of two people, if you believe Wikipedia, that were carried on, carried on the shoulders of the team players off the field. Because he tried, and he kept trying. And that's important. He surrounded himself with people that were much smarter and bigger and badder than himself. And then here's my last tip. You got to realize that not everybody out there is like you. This was a hard, hard idea and concept for me to understand. You know, I go places. I'm like, well, why didn't they pick that up? That's easy. That's easy. I can pick this lock. I can pick this six-pin lock. Really simple. I don't see why it's taking you so long. I had a hard time understanding that not everybody was like me. Until I heard a talk by Infogener sitting right there in the audience. I'm going to call you out, brother. Um, he gave a talk, and its talk at Nova Hackers was about the different types of people in InfoSec. And he helped me understand that there are a lot of different people in information security or just in information technology. Some people are there because they're hobbyists. It, incite, it excites them to play with this little tiny Raspberry Pi computer uh, just to make a light blink on and off. Some people love doing that kind of stuff. Cool, we need you. There's some people that go to work, they put in a solid nine to five. They do their job really, really well. But when they get home, they're playing with their kids, or they're helping out somebody else, or they're doing sports or something else like that, and they leave InfoSec at the office, and that's cool. We need you too in the industry. There's some people that are 24-7 people. They immerse themselves in the InfoSec lifestyle. They're, in their off hours, they go home and, and they're coding up some open source project. Or, you know, these are the type of people that when they walk by like a point of sale system and they see the USB ports pointing towards the customer, they're like, I could do this. I could exploit that system with one bad USB. 
but they don't because they're ethical people as well. Um, no, but these are the people that we also need. In fact, the information security community needs all of those people because everybody contributes. Whether you're finding the next cool way to hook up a, an Apple TV, or whether you're inventing some new, sh new uh, type of attack or defense. We need you. And so our industry and our InfraSec community mesh and merge. And if you do some of these things, I'm not saying that you have to make this into a checklist. My goal was to start with number one, then work my way through 14. You don't have to do that, ladies and gentlemen. Although that would be impressive if you did. Come back here next year like, I followed Micah's plan. Here's my misadventures. And you could give a talk here next year. But these are the ways that you can participate in the community. And you've started today, some of you. Go pick a lock. Go talk to some of the people here. Share your knowledge and grow. And that's my talk, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for me? Anybody have any questions for me? Yes, sir. You can talk. No, that's you in the red shirt. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, you said uh, basic foundation. What, or what areas do you consider basic foundation? Since you said your second slide was the canyon. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you, where do you, st where, tell me where to start within that Grand Canyon. Right, so the uh, gentleman mentions, you know, so if information security is this wide, information technology is this wide, and, and where do I even start within that to gain that foundational experience? That's a very valid question, sir. And I can tell you that the best place for you to start is somewhere that interests you. If you start out doing what I tell you to do, oh, I'm, go and do some web hacking, or go ahead and learn Python. That might be my way of doing it. Look in the blogs, look on Twitter, look on other places. Come talk to me or, or some of these other people. Go to one of these groups and see what interests you within there. And then start learning a little bit about that. And invariably, you'll have this kind of spidering, branching out thing where you're like, oh, I learned some Python. That was kind of fun. Oh, I figured out I can make web calls. Oh, with that web calls, I'll bet I can scrape data. Oh, if I can scrape data, now I can do, and that will lead you in other places. Um, the foundational things, learning networking, that's core. Learning uh, how systems run, that's core also as well. Okay? Yeah, thank you for asking. Anybody else? Questions? No? All right. Thank you very much again. Enjoy your day.